Tonight, how one man took on the energy company Enpower and won. Enpower employed five different debt collection companies to get money from Christopher Poncelet. They said he owed it, but he thought otherwise, and this week a court in Northampton agreed. The judge upheld his complaint that Enpower harassed him and ordered the company to pay £3,000 compensation. Christopher Poncelet works with an American software company. And because of the U.S. time difference, he often works through the night. So three years ago, he signed up to NPower's low-rate overnight electricity tariff. But when his bills arrived, NPower had switched him to a daytime tariff. I had paid all my bills, all the correct bills, immediately, I always do. And now I'm having to get into this silly argument where they were transposing the meter readings, even of their own meter reader. And I knew that they were wrong. I was paying them what they should um, have billed me, and I was having to do the calculations for them. Christopher became so frustrated by NPower's customer service, he even began recording his calls to them. Now let me give you my account number. Could I take your name, please? Christopher Poncelet. Thank you, sir. Hello? The dispute dragged on for three long years and even involved visits from debt collectors. It is an extraordinary case. He received 15 inaccurate bills, 11 demands for payment, including applications to the magistrate courts for warrants to enter his home forcibly. And in addition to that, an array of debt collectors turning up at his home, ringing him, writing to him, chasing money he never owed. The case finally ended up in court, and in total, N Power said he owed £600. In fact, it was found his account was in credit. The judge in this case quoted Lord Justice Jacob by saying it is one of the glories of this country that every now and again one of its citizens is prepared to take a stand against the big battalions of government or industry. In response, M Power said, we apologise to Mr Poncelet in court for the mistakes made and we are currently reviewing our procedures to prevent this from happening again. As for Mr Poncelet, he hopes his case may encourage other people to take on the big boys. It doesn't matter whether it's the Emperor of China who is saying that Tuntu is six and, and a monkey who is saying that Tuntu is four. It's the monkey who is right. Stuart Radcliffe, BBC Look East, Northampton. Well, this afternoon I spoke to Audrey Gallagher from a group which stands up for the rights of consumers and I began by asking what sort of message this case sends. I think the message that this sends to industry is that they need to take a, a really long and close look at their debt collection processes because a court of law has now found what they do every day to actually constitute harassment. So it's time that energy companies really sat up and took notice of that and made sure that they were treating their customers properly. £3,000 though to a company like Empire is just a drop in the ocean. A relatively insignificant sum has been paid out. I think the big issue here for NPower and the rest of the energy industry is just what they do around their whole debt collection processes because this type of thing is going on on a daily basis and I think it's time for a root and branch review of that to make sure that customers don't experience what Mr Ponsell went through. If somebody is getting a lot of hassle from a company and they believe that the bill that they're hassling over is incorrect, what should they do? Well, I think the first thing, clearly you've got to speak to the company. Um, if that doesn't work, there are, there are complaint handling procedures in place. There should be an escalation route to make sure that you're getting to speak to somebody more senior. And ultimately, there's a statutory ombudsman scheme, the energy ombudsman. Um, and we would, we would encourage consumers to exhaust that process before having to take it to court. Clearly that's not an ideal situation for people and while we're pleased that clearly there's been a good outcome for consumers here and something that's probably going to send a really strong message out to the energy industry, nobody should really have to go through that and a, you know, for what is a, an essential service, their, their energy supply. So you go through all of that and presumably lots of people do that but you still get the phone calls, you still get the hassle, don't you? And I think this, this is the main problem that we've seen in this case. So while there was a problem with bills, um, clearly there was a problem with the debt collection process. But I think more fundamentally, customer service was just woefully inadequate here. And that really needs to be addressed as well as all the other issues to prevent this kind of thing happening in the first place. Audrey Gallagher, thank you very much. The Tour of Britain's cycle race has arrived in the region. Today's stage was through Norfolk, starting in Kings Lynn, ending up in Great Yarmouth. Tomorrow's penultimate stage goes through Suffolk and Essex. 
It's hoped the event will bring around three million pounds to the local economy. Tom Williams has been following the tour and is at the team's hotel now. Tom. Yes, another long and gruelling day, but hey, at least the riders don't have to battle through traffic. The mechanics here just making a final few tweaks to the bike to make sure they're in decent shape for tomorrow. The riders are staying in Dunstan Hall here, uh, relaxing after a, another tough day on the roads. Um, just a couple of days to go. Today's sixth stage got underway in Kings Lynn, so it was another bright and early start. Carnival atmosphere, the band kept things lively, playing, yep, you got it, old bits of bike. It wasn't all about the professionals. School children proudly paraded their customized wheels. Members of the March Veteran and Vintage Cycle Club also caught the eye. This is an IDE special. What's so special about it? Well, it's the only one in the world, and it's basically worth £25,000. £25,000, a bone shaker. Why is it called that? Because the solid wooden wheels and very little suspension, it does shake it to pieces. And this is the oldest bike here. And the final one, the penny farthing. Right, this one then is a penny farthing, or sometimes called an ordinary or a high wheeler. This one is 1880. We're only about a third of the duration of the Tour de France. That's by far and away the biggest race. The other two, the Giro and the Vuelta, are also big races. But the Tour of Britain is, uh, is creeping up on them. It's come at the right time, the end of the summer season. Tourism is such a big uh, industry in Norfolk. And it sort of extends the summer season a bit by having this in the middle of September. 17 teams, but the main attraction, an Olympic star. It is unpredictable today, depending which way the wind's blowing. Obviously, it's quite flat and exposed at places. We run down the coast for a lot of the, a lot of the race. The Tour of Britain seems to have been well received everywhere you've been. And mm. once again, here in Kingsland this morning. Yeah, and the sun's shining for once, so that's uh, a bit better for the last few stages we've had. We had a lot of rain this race. and Yeah, great turnout this morning. And they're off 117 miles to go from the start here in Kings Lynn. In five hours, they'll have reached Great Yarmouth. 100 riders thoroughly outnumbered by an army of support vehicles. A rousing send-off as they wave goodbye to the town to hit the open road. Very few hills, the battle instead against high winds. They flew through Sheringham. Well, the experts did. And after three and a bit hours, the chasing pack known as the Peloton flashed in and out of Norwich. Just before half three, the leaders powered into Great Yarmouth. Andre Greipel winning a sprint finish. I mean, it's been really enjoyable seeing all these top-class cyclists so close to home. It's absolutely wonderful for the town. Six stages down, two to go. Tomorrow the circus pitches up in Bury and ends in Colchester. We're with the Sigma Sport specialised team here at Dunstan Hall. So much paraphernalia goes with the tour. Lorries, caravans, I was staggered by the number of support trucks that were following the riders around today. Dan Jugid is from the team. Uh, amazing, isn't it? Just got what goes with uh, this tour of Britain. Yeah, there's a lot of equipment involved, um, especially just for six riders. You're talking probably 12 bikes and double that again in wheels plus all the team vehicles, shipping equipment around to all the different hotels, because you're never in one place for more than a day. So, And Simon Richardson is the team lead. How did you find the Norfolk stage today? It was tough, actually. Uh, we've come from like the hills of Somerset into the flatlands, I guess, but uh, there's a real change of pace. Uh, we had a tailwind most of the day, so we were, we were travelling at sort of 50 kilometres an hour for most of the day. Um, and, yeah, it was, it was pretty tough going, actually. OK, guys, well, thanks for popping out this evening and let you get back to relaxing in, in the hotel. Uh, there's a photo gallery from today on the BBC Norfolk website and with the tour heading to Suffolk and Essex tomorrow. Don't forget to tune into your local BBC radio station for live coverage and, of course, the latest traffic and travel news. Great. Thank you very much, Tom.